No, I did. Yeah, and I checked and I made sure it was a thing. And I'm glad I did. Because some weeks I do a test recording and then, like, it's not it's not recording. And I'm glad I made a test recording. So this week you clearly heard me say I was making a test recording. And then you started just launching into it before I had a second to check it. So, like, what do you... Yeah, I was practicing to give you something for your test recording to listen to. But, but I don't hear you in my test recording. Though... Are you ready to start now? Oh, we've started. This is the podcast. I had such a good intro plan. Then just do I it. I doubt it. It was a good intro. Was it? Yeah. yeah. Was it always good? Go ahead was it, it good for Brainstorm Brewer or was it just good for Corbin? It's the same thing. No, go ahead and do it. I was going to say, welcome everybody to the podcast okay. that told you not to buy Carn at $20. No, What's we said wrong not to buy that? Carn at $30. Okay. We, this is the podcast that told you not to double up on car, and I thought that was a great intro. Hey, man, to be fair, we also told him not to uh, double up on History of Benalia. Good point, Jason. Good point. Hope you got your Lyra Dawnbringers. <laughs> I mean, that one worked out. <laughs> the second view is obviously an integral part of all of the financial information we spew out. Actually, the That's thing we said was the, the value thing. has to go somewhere, right? And the value did go somewhere. And it went predictably to a four mana planeswalker that's playable in multiple formats. Well, I would also which is say what we talked about like that it would be valuable if it was that playable. So I would also say we should get a little bit of a pass because it's not really on us to predict that it's going to be the best selling set in years and be sold out of distributors, right? Like that feels like some like some some confounding factors there. Yeah, There's Karn wouldn't be that much that if, Karn... like, you could actually get the packs. That's a good right. Idea. Like, if as a store we had the ability to sell you boxes, then maybe it wouldn't cost you so much to buy that Karn from us. There's a lot right. of reasons Karn is sixty dollars, and I wrote about it this week on TCGplayer.com. God, you argued with me before the podcast, and I feel so bad about complimenting your article now. <laughs> it's a really good article. I feel bad about complimenting either of you on anything ever because of how much you argued before the podcast. It was... <laughs> no, that's not why. You just always feel bad about complimenting anybody ever. Well, when they earn it. That's when you hate complimenting people the most. Yeah, but then I do it. I don't like it, but I do it. Cause well, then... then you're going to love this episode because this is the episode where... Uh... Just I'm like the all best of those, at pick of the week, something like that. Just like all those Karn picks and so on. This is the episode where we look back over our picks for a year. This is the one year anniversary of us having a uh, a breaking bulk pick of the week tracker. Uh, shout out to everyone who who keeps this thing going uh, because uh, hey, it's pretty how do, awesome. How do they access the tracker? I'm the one that you keeps may be this asking. thing going. I'm the one that puts all the information into it. No, well, not all of it. I put. Yeah, and you taught you taught it to pull from you. You did all the back end programming of this thing. I put most of the information into it. So you, I, so you're you're claiming credit for the spreadsheet because you put the numbers in the cells. Correct. Okay. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, you're probably poor. Uh, because you don't go to patreon.com slash brainstorm brewery and subscribe at the twenty dollars it's it's per it's per episode, right guys? I've always heard it was per this, episode. This joke is per episode. That's your, true. Your <laughs> face is per episode. That's Look, unfor- man, that's unfortunately true also. Ron Popiel had to had to do a lot of the same pitches over and over again and he never got tired of it, and neither did his fans. So you know I'm what? Like, I can't even complain because he does the super pitch every week. But you know what? It actually kind of, kind of works. And then we get like, wanting to put back into the podcast. Like, we're trying to hound some artists into making us some tokens. That's a real thing. <laughs> We've been trying for a long time. They're trying to hound me. Uh, if we get another person who subscribes at the $20 level at patreon.com slash brainstorm brewery because of this episode, I'll send everyone who's owed their glasses Extra glasses. <laughs> is that what we determined? Well, that's what I'm determining. That's I haven't done a, it yet. Wow. Remember last right, time I was like, more. dude, I'm going to do it. DJ one sent more. me an email with all the, the people that were supposed to get glasses. Yeah, and you said and I got you the email and then last and then week? No, I didn't do it. That. Uh, the weekend got away <laughs> from me. I was like, oh, i got to do this. And then I um, didn't. I, 
I didn't. I I sorted a bunch of my own cards instead. I was like, ah, I should sit down, turn on some Netflix, and package up these glasses. And then I just sorted a bunch of my own cards uh, and buy-listed them because that's what I wanted to do. But what so, you're saying is one more, and you're going to do. Yeah, it. if we get one, if we get a person who in like the notes when they subscribe to our Patreon at Patreon.com/slash/BrainstormBrewery, uh, even if they were at another level. And they go up to 20, uh, and they're like, this is because of the thing. I'm going to send everyone who's owed glasses extra glasses. Wow. I haven't like punishing our long-term supporters like that. Uh, I can send (laughs) our long-term supporters extra glasses, too. I really want to get rid of this. I really want to get rid of the second wave of glasses, because I hate them. Third wave is worth that. Yeah, well, the third wave might be the first company. We'll, we'll have to <laughs> if we what can if talk we just, them into dealing with us. What if we just convince them we were a different company? Yeah, with the same logo, new, new ownership. We have the intern we, contact. We ousted them. the yeah. guy that you dealt with before was ousted in a corporate takeover. <laughs> it was hostile. It was very hostile. Yeah, he's no longer with the company. It was and... he was hostile, so we were hostile. That's a perfect. That's perfect. You think they'll buy it? I mean, I think we're buying it. I think it's reasonable to try. They'll sell it to us. I really, I really like their glasses a lot. It's reasonable. And the thing is, it's actually if it doesn't work, it's hilarious anyway. So, so if you if you have the second generation of glasses like the the one I've got here, um, hand wash them. You should hand wash them anyway. They're brainstorm brewery memorabilia. You should put it in the dishwasher like they're a peasant. Wow! Did you guys hear that? That. That's oh, that? that's Oklahoma in May, guys. <laughs> what are you outdoors? Uh, I'm, I'm in my I'm in my office. That's just the thunder, man. Your yeah. office is a shed. Say you're in a shed, not your office. <laughs> I thought the OKC Thunder didn't make the playoffs. Oh, yeah. my, my, that happened. My wife sent me a uh, like scaredy face from inside too. That was some intense thunder. Hmm. I wonder if it's gonna tornado. I wonder Jake. if it's gonna continue to cock block my pitch. <laughs> anyway. I don't know, man. The people that are like our day one Patreon subscribers got good glasses instead of like more bad ones. So I don't know. Maybe it's a wash. If you if you send me a two hundred word essay <laughs> saying that you got glasses already, but you deserve more of them, maybe I'll think about it. But anyway, um, if you go to patreon.com slash brainstorm brewery, you can have access to the spreadsheet we're going to be talking about for a lot of this episode where we track our picks of the week and our breaking bulk picks. So and, the, uh, this is the one opportunity the poor yeah. get to listen to our picks from a year ago. So get your notepads out, kids. Get, wow. Well, and, and here's the th- and here's the thing: it's coming it, from DJ, the kiddiest of them all. Not only can you like track the stuff a year later and kind of see how the the stuff fluctuates week to week, you know, how, how, kind of how some of the picks pay off longer term or stuff like that. Uh, you can also see the the stuff updated on Monday night. The, the podcast doesn't go live for free till Friday, so you could have actually. You know what our picks of the week and uh, breaking bulk picks are four days early, so that's valuable. That's that's why that we, is particularly why we valuable do recently with things like Realm of Obedience and uh, yeah, so some on. of the stuff that like really like spikes even before the episode Born, goes Born of out. Greed is, was one that could. I mean, it didn't, but it's one of those. If it's a profile that could spike just on a moment's notice, you know. So uh, it's, uh, so so we we think it's worth it. We, we're we're not trying to just be like, hey, give us money because we're a podcast. We're really trying to to provide value with the the play mats, the tokens, the early picks, and being able to buy your way out of the podcast. So I don't know. That's our so, Patreon pitch. We would like to pitch some other stuff. Maybe we'll this will be the future space for the Squatty Potty pitch. We don't know. We'll see. Buy so, a Squatty Potty, just not yet. So speaking of the spreadsheet, what do you get, numbers aside? What do each of you consider your best pick of the week since May twenty or May of twenty uh, seventeen? Of twenty seventeen, since like last year, like a year ago today. Like every looking at the spreadsheet, what is your best pick on this spreadsheet? Not just like number value percentage. Sure, or... sure, sure. I'll go first. I mean, it's tempting to say something like reserve lists or whatever, but that's not the kind of stuff. That's whether or not we make good reserve list picks or not. That's not really worth. It. That's not hard to me, right? Um, the stuff I'm proud about, most proud of, I would say, are some of the, the more time-sensitive things that actually come from having my finger sort of on the pulse of different formats, right? Yeah, so, so before you before you go too deep into it, uh, uh, like, Corbin, you can say what you think your best pick of the week is, and then me and Jason can just sort of, like, sure. say, say, like, say what your best pick of the week is or worst. Right. Like, just Absolutely. Sort of give some jabs uh, or best picks of worst picks. All right. 
I'm putting, I'm calling my best one as meddling mage on uh, October of 2017. That's fair. That's that was a really good one. Up, uh, up you, to 250%. Yeah, you called meddling mage at around eight dollars, and it is sitting at 27. Um, what made you pick meddling mage yeah. on that date? Five color humans. That's when it first started showing up at the first tournament, and I recognized how good it was, and that it was only going to get better. Uh, and that's one of those, you know, everyone makes fun of me for following modern and whatever, but that's that's why I, I follow it, so you don't have to. Um, so, Meddling Mage fills that role. Logic Knot does as well. Yeah, Logic Knot wasn't a bad pick. I, mean, I got in on Logic Knot when it was 36. Yeah, and it was almost... That was, that almost that was my break, breaking the best bulk breaking bulk pick ever. a while back, yeah. I, yeah. I picked that as breaking bulk a while back. Um, what about you guys? Uh, I think your best pick of the week was Vidalcan Ori. Yep, that was the other one I'd look at. I mean, that's the same kind of thing, too, that it almost what feels... What made you even pick that? Was that because it was on, like, the, the interest on MTG stocks, or was that because Josh Lee Kwai said to put it in every single EDH deck, <laughs> and everyone went, okay, because he uh, said that to 100,000 people. Well, this was back in... Vidalcan Ori in June of last year, so... Yeah. That was way ahead of the curve, and I think that was just a card that sort of hit the bottom of its little... Uh, valley and right it's just it's just sorta... really it's just really easy in, in my it, it's easy i guess it, it's maybe i don't know if, it, it seems easy to us because we do it all the time right but people just forget about these sets whether it's conspiracy or eternal masters or whatever they forget about these sets that put a, a big needed reprint out onto the market and it gets cheap and they just forget about it and sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't yeah because but... the price goes down and then they remember that's the price and then a year or two later they're like when did well, this yeah, go what up? happened like, uh, but you know what uh, it it's went cause... up 20 cents a week for two years what are you talking about it's because people follow the headlines only they go to mtg stocks and they look at the yep. arts that gained 50 percent in a day and they don't go down and dig into the one and two percent gainers or go to the week one and look at what gained one or two percent in the past week or say hey i remember this set i marked it to come back and check on six months later now I'm checking on it six months later. That's how you find stuff like this. And it's not, it just takes a little, I mean, it takes work for one, but also it takes experience, but it's not hard, right? You don't have to be a genius to do it. You just have to put in the work. Right. Uh, before you get too high on your uh, horse there, let's talk about picking Consecrated Sphinx. Yeah, well, you sometimes at, uh, get blown up by a reprint. At $25 there. Yeah, it was climbing. Sometimes you get blown up by a reprint. I mean, if that's if that's your dumb, <laughs> no, your dumb, know. dumb pick, you know, it was a, no, a I reprint. Agree. And... Uh, Corbin's done pretty well for the picks of the week over the past year. Like, he's up, uh, if you, assuming you used MTG Goldfish prices, and assuming you picked up one of every pick of the week at the start price, your total gain is around $110, which is pretty good. I mean, assuming you pick, like, one of uh, Cryptolith Rite, one of Aura Shards, one of Sigarda, one of... Ruination, right. one of de one of meddling mage, and uh, your total well, percentage gain would be around two thousand percent. Yeah, that's and... going that's going equally deep on the stuff that he felt strongly about and the stuff he didn't feel strongly about. Well, and, that, and, probably... and that's also assuming that you buy at that week and then sell now. Right, that's the big thing, and that's that's going to be a common theme as we go through this. Because, for instance, uh, one of my picks on here was Heart of Kieran when it was five dollars, and Heart of Kieran went to like ten or fifteen bucks. Right now, Heart of Kieran's four bucks. You know that's that's uh, so it's it, it's a dynamic tracker, so it's registering right. it as a loss when you had the opportunity to triple up if you sold at the right time. Now it's possible, and maybe our fans can get back to us on what they want. But you know, maybe we should be doing. I, I brought this up in the Discord, uh, sell of the week, or uh, you know, hey, this is time. And I think a lot of times we do that. We talk about it in the um, podcast, just as sort of part of the episode, but we don't sort of lock it into a spreadsheet sort of thing, right? Because you know, say. If we were really interested in going full on with the track, and we can say, well, I said to sell Heart of Kieran at this, so we're locking in this price for the tracker. But to me, that's not the point, right? Everyone, it, the, the point of this tracker is not, um, and it's fun to look at and see the gains and the percentages and all that, right? Um, we're we're all around 2,000%. That's that's really cool, right? Um, but to me, it's not, it, it's not necessarily about that. It's about everyone can just look at this themselves and decide whether or not it's a good call. And they can look at Heart of Kieran and know what happened there, and we don't need to. Right get overly granular and tracking it yeah i agree it's uh, been fun for sure I've, I've enjoyed having this list yeah i mean Jason's... having a little bit of accountability i think um, yeah absolutely instead of just farting out picks into a microphone every week after week i think people yep. can see that uh, <laughs> you know this I goes mean, back can see that we're not off with this i tried to run a prediction tracker uh on quiet speculation 
uh, like a million years ago when I first started because of the same thing. I wanted accountability because people would tell you to buy something at $20 in the set review and it would go down to two bucks and then they brag about their card that went up $5. And that's the really thing that actually back nine years ago now really spurred me into being like, man, I got to do this because I can't stand seeing the quote unquote financial experts do this. And I tried to manually run a prediction Who were the tracker. quote unquote financial experts nine years ago? I'm not going to name names, man. <laughs> It was like nobody though. It was like who was doing it? Well, that uh, I can tell you this is right when it started. Jason, you're baiting him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I know you know, but I'm avoiding your traps. None of our listeners know. That, then then it, it won't matter way. to them, yeah. So uh Jason uh if I notice a single trend over this spreadsheet, it's you picking cards from pre-2005 sets at like a dollar and then cards being printed in commander decks that have synergy with those cards and then those dollar cards becoming like five or six dollar cards so uh, that's basically yeah that's what i like to do yeah, i like Thalicose to Thalicose deceiver um sea hunter was a really good one uh sapling symbiosis is a recent one just cards that like are from invasion or nemesis n- invasion or nemesis that's just like that have basically no supply and it's really easy to anticipate that demand it's and you just you can do database stuff. You can look on EDH rec and see, hey, you know, forty three percent of the um, the slime foot decks have Cyberlink symbiosis in it, and you're like, well, uh, I guess we pick that out of box, right? Well, like we, it, we had a really good talk in Discord the other day about how to properly use some of the EDH rec. Data. I don't believe you, Corbin. <laughs> That's fine, man. <laughs> you may yeah, not I have been there. That, the rest I of us were. I believe that we have a Corbin bot that occasionally yeah. makes automated yeah. posts True. in Discord. Yeah, and uh, yeah, man, it passed the Turing test then. Everyone believes so, that like, bot was real that day. When they print a new card, like, I don't know, like Blade of Cells or something like that, it's real... Everyone wants to know, what's the price on this card going to do? And that's not always easy to divine but i think what is easier to divine is to be like man thalco's deceiver is going to go in these uh these marisol decks you know and uh and hex like parasites Hunter, gonna, yeah sea yeah Hunter's yeah thing. hex parasites going to get paired up with the um with the the uh, the, the sagas. Uh, sagas and stuff like that so I, I think um that's a little easier to to figure out and um I think it's kind of easy to to get a lot of these hits on these just like one dollar pre two thousand five cards, like you said, that are just all of a sudden a new deck archetype comes around. They're like, well, hey, here's Nekasar. Could perhaps forced fruition be a card? And that uh, instead of saying, hey, what's Nekasar's price going to do? Look at the all the wheel effects it's going to make go up. You know, so yep. I like to look at the cards that are affected by a printing rather than the printing itself. Yep. And if you kind of go back and and look what people are going to play, you pick that dollar forty surge spinner, it goes to five fifty, and then you can pretend you're better at this than you are. So, I honestly, I'm not picking modern, so it's it's not as timely. I got a couple weeks to look at EDH rec and really see what the data's saying and see if people are building the way I assume they're going to build. And uh, if I'm right, I'll buy the cards. And if some of my predictions are wrong, I. It does me no good to be like, yeah, well, you should be playing this because if no one's playing it, even if it's a good card, me impotently raging at EDH as a whole for not adopting some tech I discovered isn't really going to help me as a financier. So tilting at windows, maybe I can, as they say. Yeah, you know, so uh, it it pays to have a little bit of time to see if people are actually adopting the tech you think they'll adopt, and um, so that's why I think the EDH picks are a little bit safer, and that's why I had. The I had the lowest number gain, but I because I'm picking those one dollar cards. But I had the highest percentage gain just because when you hit on a one dollar card going to six, you really hit percentage wise. Twenty four hundred percent, pretty good. Especially yeah, if you but consider... you only if you if you bought every if you bought every card one copy of one I said to and sold it today, you would have only made about seventy one bucks. So yeah, but let's look at it this way, right? And this is what we talk about with most of our listeners is. They're just trying to play the game for cheaper. They're yeah. commander players. You, you put them on a card, they get to save money on that card for what they're... Yeah, um, not everybody that's, wants that's a Thalicos to, like a pile of Thalicos to see versus to ship out to TCG player. A lot of these are just, oh, I can save $4 by per- buying it now as opposed to later. Right. Or they buy two copies, trade one away at five, and then they ended up with eight bucks right. worth of exactly. extra trade stock. Yep. All right, so what's the uh, what, do you, what would you consider your best pick on here? Um... Uh, Oh, Jason. Oh, you're asking me what I thought uh, my best I, I, was? I mean, I'm interested in what both of you think about Jason's picks. We did it with mine. 
Uh, Jason, what do you think your best one is, though? And then we'll see what the rest of us think. Well, percentage-wise, I really... I mean, it was cheating calling something like Mana Vortex, because anything right. that's going to be on the reserve list is just going to... And that's sort of why this is a good question, because we're not asking what is your best pick percentage-wise, we're asking what is your most valuable pick per listeners, because telling people to buy Mana Vortex at $3 is basically cheating. Yeah. I liked uh, I liked Sea Hunter. I agree. I think that's that was your best pick. That was your pick that I spent money on, I'll put it that way. Naming picks that I don't even know what the card is in the first place is great. Well, I mean, Mog Catcher and um, the Elf one probably are bad too, but Sea Hunter is just sort of like... Merfolk are huge right now. You know, all the Merfolk decks are going to be blue. You're going to be able to tutor for Merfolk. It's a, a slow card that you're not going to be able to play in Modern or, or Legacy. Well, you can't play in Modern because it's not legal, but it's too slow for Legacy. But it's it's right in that that perfect spot where we finally have enough good Merfolk to start having Merfolk decks in EDH. And that's why Sea Hunter never popped before because nobody was really playing Merfolk decks. And now all of a sudden you have enough of them. You've got a good creature-based uh, tutor to go get any merfolk in the deck. All of a sudden, that looks real attractive. It was from Nemesis, so it's real old. It's a pre-Mythic era rare. So yep. something like that, it just it seemed real easy. But that was one of those cards that everyone's going to be like, wasn't that just a dollar? When did this hit five bucks? I, I don't understand. That was one of those things where instead of talking about it after it went up, we were very easily able to predict before it went up. So that was... Uh, I, I think that I have was, a couple. Uh, I think that was uh, another pick where Merfolk as a tribe don't really have a whole lot of ways to tutor for something. So that was the single linchpin in terms of what is the Merfolk that lets me get the rest of my Merfolk. Like if you play elves, you have a uh, Sky Shroud Poacher. I think it is. You have Sky Shroud Poacher, but you also have like Elvish Harbinger. Elvish Harbinger. You have like yeah. uh, all these other elf tutor cards that are like goblins. You get Goblin Recruiter. You get Goblin Matron. You get just Goblin. Uh, even um, ringleader ri yeah that's what i was thinking of ringleader yeah. you have yeah, all these other ways too. to generate card advantage and blue is the color of card advantage yes but as a tribe they didn't really have a way other than like maybe distant melanies to just put a bunch of cards from your deck into play for such a low cost and sea hunter was just sort of that linchpin that every single merfolk is like i want to play more merfolk yeah. i i think my favorite pick you made was savala stampede uh, because you made that pick in June of last year, which is really, really good on that card. It's doubled since then. Um, and it's one of those, I don't remember if it's a mythic or a rare out of conspiracy. It's a rare. Yeah, but it's just, it's really good. It's not Tooth and Nail, but it's almost more fun than Tooth and Nail, in my in my opinion. Uh, tooth I and Nail, agree with that. Tooth and Nail almost never even resolves, right? You usually put Tooth and Nail on the stack and then people scoop. Right? Yeah. So Valus Stampede is actually just a really fun, powerful card that you actually get to play Magic with. I am of the camp that Tooth and Nail should be banned in Commander. If I get to add one card and take away one card, it is plus Tooth and Nail minus Mana Crypt for the ban list. Or, yeah. Ban, ban Mana Crypt and Tooth and Nail. Yes. Uh, unban uh, Coalition Victory and, like, Sway of the Stars or something like that. Sure, I agree. Those are both pretty bad. And I, I even play... It's almost bad, too, because I play Tooth and Nail fairly in that I only have three-card combos in most of my decks. So when I resolve a Tooth and Nail in, like, my Carador deck... Uh, because I just didn't want to play Triskelion and Mikaish, just because, like, I don't want to be that guy, right? Yeah. Uh, people are like, oh, you win, right? And I'm like, no. And then there's like, oh, you suck. Because, like, you're taught as a, as a Magic player who plays To scoop Commander. them up on someone, yeah. Well, right, and to do that, and basically, like, if you... And maybe this is just for my groups, because it's not like we're playing, again, competitive EDH, where we're winning on turn three, but we are trying to win. So you kind of feel like if you... If somebody resolves a Tooth and Nail, and no one at the table can either stop the Tooth and Nail... Or respond to the creatures once they hit play you kind of quote unquote deserve to lose right yep. so it's actually I, people are almost disappointed when you don't win with it because they're yeah. like man now you're taking mercy on me or whatever yeah you could have killed me but you chose not to and you're being a dick about it yeah right um, and it's not even if they think you're a dick but just like you kind of mentally right as yeah. a competitive person you feel like well this happened i've lost <laughs> like i lost right uh, I mean, this comes a little bit off the discussion we had on competitive EDH last week, and I have sort of have always had a difficulty explaining the way I personally try to play Commander, uh, but I just generally think of my decks as competitive EDH, but specifically not trying to win with a combo. 
and I, I think was... that's a good uh, description of my decks is that like I don't intentionally throw oh yeah I'm going for like my Archangel Avison deck is a good example I have an Mana Crypt in there I have a Sword of Feast and Famine in there I have a Stoneforge in there I have a Batter Skull in there I also have Kiki Jiki and Zealous Conscripts but the goal of the deck is not to put Z Kiki Jiki and Zealous Conscripts into play immediately as fast as possible right They're it's just a deck that has it yeah, it is a deck that is built on the synergy of those two cards, and not every time I'm playing uh, Imperial Recruiter or Recruiter of the Guard, I'm not just going to get Kiki Jiki. Yeah. So it basically comes combo. down. It basically comes down to tutors, right? Because I play lots of decks with combos in them. But I mean, I play a I lot of tutors, tutors too, but no. I don't like specifically try to go for the combo every single time. I see. Well, when my I think the sort of build casually, play competitively aspect. I'm trying to win every game I'm in, but I I'm not going to choose not to kill somebody when I have the ability to kill right. them. But I am going to not fill my deck with a bunch of tutors to make every game be the same and not be fun. Fair. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to DJ's picks here. Uh, oh, boy. This is this is just, this is medium, middle of the road here. Jason gets to claim the highest percentage gain. I get to claim the highest number game. DJ's around the middle of the pack. Uh, I can agree with that, and I think a part of the reason, uh, this isn't really an excuse, but several of my picks over the past year have been sealed product. And so, sealed product is, uh, noticeably hard to track when you're using a, uh, price tracker yeah. because there's no <laughs> real way to trade the impossible. data on, like, soul booster boxes of Conspiracy or Commander Anthology, um... But personally, if I'm picking my favorite pick that I've made over the past year, it was on February when I picked the 2015 Wade into Battle Commander deck. And it is the one that just got reprinted in Commander Anthology 2, yeah, that was noticeably cool. because Gavin Verhey came out and said, hey, this deck's not very powerful, and it wasn't very well received, but it matched the color balance for what we were trying to go to, and it just had reprints we needed to get into stock or get into players' hands. So this is a deck that I noticed was available... For around $45 on Amazon, there was a bunch of copies available on eBay, TCG Player, stuff like that, and I saw the, I just went to a site that had the deck list available, and I added up the buy list prices of those cards that are in the deck, and the, the buy list price, not even just the retail price, was higher than the cost of the deck itself. So the absolute worst I could do was just buying up all those decks and then taking four or five hours of my day sorting them shipping them off carking them and so i made a pretty yeah if sizable... you can make money arbitraging you're making serious money as a tcg player seller yeah and that's like jason said not even counting the amount of bonus money i get from just selling on tcg player or at an event or some like selling in my store or something like that so i made a pretty sizable investment putting my money more my mouth was with that weight in the battle deck and it paid off like many many dividends for me right. and uh i mean when that deck was announced i still had several of those cards in stock so they now i woke up and they announced uh what's her name Kalemne was going to be reprinted i immediately woke up went to card kingdom's website and biolisted like seven it doesn't even my... like if you look at what happened with C commander anthology one those prices didn't really go down at all no not really just, but it's just something i don't want to be growth basically yeah it's just what, something yeah. i don't want to be stuck with anymore so right. I, I sold all the rest of my fiery confluences i gave them nice stack or urza's incubators uh they bought my command towers at 75 cents a piece which was ridiculous but it's pretty good it's beside the point <laughs> i uh looking at your list so the total gain is literal pennies <laughs> literally a nickel away from uh higher than jason uh but the percentage is 1700 percent uh which is not exactly bad right nothing to scoff at there my favorite pick you made is cyclonic rift because you do a yep. really good job uh i would say better than i do certainly at tracking the commander decks um they tend to just not even hit my radar most of the time um but, you know, you nailed Cyclonic Rift at the perfect time, and it's literally doubled since then, despite being in Commander decks all the time, or whatever, right? So, uh, you're you're always on top of that stuff. Well, you have the lowest percentage because you got nailed by reprints more than anybody else, because you, without regard for reprint risk, will just call stuff as you see it, because you figure you will sell out before. So, you look at a year later, right. there's some stuff you got out of before it got reprinted, yep. and you got dinged. That's fair. That that you're, uh, you're, you you suffered percentage wise when you weren't holding any copies. And I mean, Corbin, you you said that uh, Cyclonic Rift got dinged with a billion Commander deck reprints, but that just goes to show. I mean, this isn't an insult, but you don't know how many Commander decks that card's been in. It's been in one. Yep, just <laughs> the blue true. one, the Teferi one. one. 
Well, it was I in see... a one to fairy deck, and then it was in Modern Masters 2017. Yeah. That's true. That's, that's what it was, yeah. But like that card is just something that every single time there's these blue commander decks, and there's not a Cyclonic Rift in any of them. Yeah. That's a billion more blue decks that that's need Cyclonic you... Rifts. It you is say... the most played card in Commander that's not Soul Ring. Yeah, I mean, yep. you, you say on top of it much better than me because I knew I thought like I, I obviously when this, it got reprinted in Commander, I bought them all. I have a million at my store, and I've had a million at the store ever since then. But in terms of actually just tracking it to it's one of those things that almost sometimes I take for granted, and I definitely have missed Cyclonic Rift-like cards in Commander decks. I think Zendikar Resurgent is actually a really interesting recent example of that, where we all kind of talked about the card when it came out in Oath of the Game Watch, maybe? Yes. Uh, and then it just did nothing, and the price did nothing. And then it got reprinted in a Commander deck, and then it got expensive. Yep. Which is just, dude, it's kind of weird, right? It's just kind of crazy. Just people discovered the card, I guess, um, and said, oh, I want this in all of my decks. Um but that's the kind of thing I sometimes I those things just they they leave my radar and don't enter it again. Which uh, which I guess why that's why that's why there's three of us, right? Yep. <laughs> but you, if you uh, look at you look at something like you know the top hundred cards on EDA track. Well, the, the, some of the stuff we talk about like it, it'll just shrug off reprint after reprint. The Cyclonic Rift didn't really get as many it need as it needed, but stuff like Source of Plowshares and Eternal Witness get tons of reprints. Eternal just Witness, doesn't seem yeah. Eternal hard. Witness is still seven dollars. Yep. That's that's that one's insane to me because Eternal Witness is a card I've bought every single one of I've ever had put in front of me to buy. Um, and for a while, I actually thought maybe it just hit the end. Like maybe this is the reprint that killed it, and now it's seven dollars again. And, and that's six printings. And yep. I sell them like crazy. It's insane. Can't keep them in stock no matter how many I buy. And there's also a trend with cards that are in a single, um, not a single deck per se, but a single year's worth of commander decks. So uh, one of my recent picks was Path of Ancestry at $2. Path of Ancestry was the one I was going to say was my favorite pick of yours, and you picked that in April. It wasn't even that long ago, yep. and it, it, it's doubled since April. It's more than doubled. It's five now. Well, I'm I'm going by the tracker. That's true. So it says four eighty five on uh, yeah. MPG Goldfish. So if you want to argue with the data, sure, <laughs> you're the best. I mean, okay. Now, so See, everyone who bought one of your cards got a thousand dollars. Doesn't matter what the tracker says. <laughs> now this tracker is actually pretty fun. I uh, I haven't looked at it as much uh, like every week, but it's really nice now a year later to be able to look back at it. So I can look and see that I picked uh, promo Thunderbreak Regent, and that did not work. Out. I mean, that wasn't based on faulty logic, though. That was right around the time when uh, was, yeah. the Dragon deck was about to come out. So, yeah. and it was a cheap promo, and it was not that. I guess people just don't like it. Well, people are playing Thunderbreak Regent in in Legacy. It's a real card, yeah. Like Dragon Stompy is a thing, but I guess people just really don't like the promo because it's down. Since then, it's insane. Well, let's just go buy them all and then say we were right. And let's it's from Dragons of Tarkir. There weren't even that many of them opened, right? Like, it was a third set. Yeah, I collected company in it, I guess. But it was a third set. It's nuts, but yeah, there's just... Uh, I don't know what to tell you, dog. Thunderbreak Region, I, I just can't believe it's... I mean, it's funny, actually, because we're talking about it We can it sit now. here and scoff. Copper Gnomes only went up eight cents. <laughs> it's one of those... All of these things that we're like, ah, I just can't believe this ever happened. They're going to print some new dragon set. Thunderbreak Region will be $10, and I'll be like, yep, wish I had actually kept them or whatever. I don't even know if I still have yeah, any selling at the Yeah, selling at the wrong time is, is yep. just as bad as not buying or buying at the wrong time, too. So that's I'm, that's something we all need to get better at, because yep. we're not tracked on our ability of when we said to sell the cards. We just like, yeah, if you kept it until today, we're doing, we're doing great. But we could have gotten even more money if we'd sold at the right time and yep. had that money free to buy the next spec. I have my spec box sitting here on, on my desk, and uh, you have to just be willing to take a pass through it every now and then, right? So one of the oh, things I I've found, been... uh, I found 30 or 40 River Kelpies two days ago. It was great. <laughs> there you go. I think I definitely have some of those in my bulk boxes. I'm going to have behind me. I'm going to have to go dig through when I get through get a chance there's, there's like four or five six thousand rares back there but uh yeah i have my spike box here and i was just going through it last week or two weeks ago or something just from time to time and one of the things i've been really high on was um infect pieces because of how high they were to, or how hard they were to reprint and the deck was a thing and we had seen some spikes on some etc cetera, etc cetera. so i have a bunch of glistener else and blighted agents and so on but i also had like mutagenic growths and ground spells and card kingdom was randomly paying a dollar fifty 
on mutagenic growths. And it's like a $2 card or something. So that's like a crazy percentage to get in cash for it. And I was just like, pulled 40 of them out and sold them. And that's the kind of thing that maybe they were just buying that many for a week, right? And if you don't just look through your spec box occasionally, you're not going to be able, you're not going to find that opportunity. Because I've looked at it before and said they've only been paying 25% or something on them where you're definitely not going to sell them. Um, but if you just, you know, follow it closely enough and just take some time every month to check, you you can find some good deals like that. You can find the 250 Masters of the Pearl Trident you bought five years ago as a joke <laughs> to make fun of Corbin. Yeah, you could do that. And I mean, well, one I, more... Uh... They're all free because I when they hit like five bucks buy list, I... I got out of so they're all you're they're all, all free. You're I definitely should have buy listed them all. And one more thing bucks. I want to talk about just real quick, um, just based on a couple of my picks, is that two of the cards I picked relatively close to each other are uh Rid Tether from Planar Chaos and Splinter Twin. Uh I mean they're both banned in or one of them's banned in modern, one of them's never really been played in modern, but both of those cards are just very, very or long term or very short term holds, depending on what Wizards decides to do. Um, Retether is a card that could very easily go to just $10 if they just print a single random Eldrazi conscript or Eldrazi conscription Escora. And if Splinter Twin gets unbanned, people hold the number happy. So, uh, a lot of these cards that all of us have picked, like Tr- Temporal Trespass is a card that's probably going to continue to go up. Um, I actually expect on that one. I have a bunch of those in here too, even though it was Jason's pick. Yep. Yeah, you pick Temporal Master, I pick Temporal Trespass. Yeah, and so, like, a lot of us have cards on here where the the gain and loss percentage is just, like, 0.00, but these are still cards that uh, could still bear fruit in the future. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so there you go. That's Spreadsheet Talk, everybody. Let us know what you think. I mean, this is something that has been requested by people is for us to go back and talk about our picks in the past, and uh, we, 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 for a long time, literal five years of this podcast, didn't really have a great system for tracking it with prices and everything, but this spreadsheet... Does some pretty awesome work for doing that. So this this was definitely fun to go back and look at. Let us know if it was valuable to you or anything you want us to change in the future. But uh, what was your what was everybody's worst percentage wise? Worst percentage wise? Let's see here. I think mine was I said Blood Sworn Steward at a buck sixty. Now it's a dollar, so I lost forty percent. I'm in minus thirty six on that Consecrated Sphinx and blown up by the reprint. Uh, oh, Necropolis Region too, blown up by a reprint. Yeah. Mine, I mean, Marionette Master maybe, but that one is sort of like a jump and then a loss. But other than that, uh, I mean, Stubborn Denial too. I picked that at a dollar fifty, and then it went up to like two or so, but now it's back down to a dollar. So like, there wasn't really a loss or gain because like it's just like Jason's pick. Like the margins on it were so small that the percentage is like sort of negligible. Um, Startled the Wake, I picked at three dollars, and now it's two dollars. That feels kind of bad. Well, that's one that I thought would like. Well, that's what's so like, crazy. I don't know if mill is just less of a thing now than it used to be. Um, because I don't even think I'm going to check real quick. I don't even think we've seen the growth on glimpse the unthinkable that you would expect after it got reprinted. Like, is mill just no longer the thing that casual players are doing? I think it's I think still more a- casual players are playing EDH and mills atrocious. There. Yeah, I think that I think that is absolutely true. I think that's a part of it. Um, for Glimpse the Unthinkable specifically, I the only reason that card was ever thirty dollars was because it hadn't gone without it or hadn't right. had a reprint, and right, so I, I don't agree. think it can really climb back to like that fifteen or twenty dollars no, no, no. high because uh, casual players don't really like that card or that well, price point. I would agree with that, but the thing is, it got reprinted in Iconic Masters a while ago, right? And yeah. it is still falling. It's at an all time low. And if we go to the Iconic really? Masters, yeah, if we go to the Iconic Masters version, it's five dollars and has been. Uh, market price is five dollars, and it's been completely flat for uh, almost a year, right? Um, I think Jason nailed it. I, I really think it's a lot of this casual players do X sort of thing that we have in our heads of mattering. Maybe a relic from ten years ago, because now people aren't playing mill and life gain. And life gain cards are still worth money, right? That's a thing. But the this the sixty card strategies, commander is more accessible than it's ever been. Yep, uh, and I think that that explains something like why glimpse the unthinkable is cheaper today the, the the iconic masters version is cheaper today than it was six months ago and that's crazy given how cards always tend to climb at the beginning of a year and it's not we've seen other iconic masters climb so yeah i think that that's that may be a dead it's just not an, an easy it's not a guaranteed way to make money 
Because yeah, I remember we were like, ah, no Planeswalker ever stays below five bucks, and then they're sort of like, yeah, we'll show you. So, <laughs> yeah, and some of these hard and yeah. fast rules, I think you gotta, you gotta adapt. I mean, with there's the another. Times. Uh, that's a really good theory on Commander and how it impacts sixty card prices. I never really thought of that, but I had a completely different reason as to why I thought Start of the Wake had ended up being failing or ended up failing. Okay, and that's um that I think that it's harder to uh, get, get casual players to adapt to double face cards price wise. Because they don't um, use sleeves? I mean, some of them don't use sleeves. Some of them, it's just, like, frustrating to, like, have the physical act of, like, constantly switching it back and forth. I don't... I'm not 100% sure. This isn't a hard fact or anything. But Start of the Wake just has, like, a lot of hoops that it has to jump through to go towards being a... Sure. ...relevant card. And I think the same trend could be argued, maybe, for Archangel Avacyn in terms of, like, being a legendary mythic angel that ended up falling to $3. Yes, it got up from the vault printing, but that's sort of the type of legendary mythic angel we would expect to uh, be a slow gainer over time. Um, yeah, there's another one. What was the... the split card from... I guess it would have been Dragon's Maze? The, that milled eight? Uh, breaking and Entering. Yeah, that card... Nothing. Still, well, that was a promo. And that, that was, was a, a that was promo. a promo that I was just like, I have hundred copies of that promo right. that I was just waiting. Exactly. On. Me too. And I get that. Yeah, it was. A, there were a lot of copies of the promo. Blah blah blah. DJ, but like, it's been five years. No, and it's I agree. Still a bulk yeah. rare. Now the the counterpoint to all of this is that archive trap is at an all time high. Um, but this is mill is a deck in modern, and archive trap is a four of in it, and it yes. has had success. Um, it's not a tier one deck, but it is it is a playable deck. So don't you, tell I, my wife. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, like Mind Funeral, I think has shown a similar uh, resiliency. So it would be an interesting case study. But I think that if you basically separate out the competitive mill cards, the the modern deck ones, compared to the casual ones, yeah, it's just been totally different. But that said, Glimpse is in both, and it's still done nothing. So yeah, there's just well because I, I I think. I think the only people who want Glimpse are the uh, competitive players, and if they were playing Mill, they probably had their copies already. That's also, also, that's Mesmeric, also a good point. Mesmeric Orb is also a... Uh, <laughs> that's a card. Yes. Again, Mesmeric that's, Orb is like $20. Yeah, but again, that's one that uh, is basically a... It's it's a modern deck. I think I think that's what we're seeing, is the, the cards in the modern deck, um, for the most part, and like the only people you see value. playing orb are the people playing the modern deck. You don't see casuals playing orb, right? Uh, so it's interesting. And I think the fact that just the fact that glimpse has been is less today than it was six months ago after everything else has climbed is just not a great sign uh, for 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 that. So it's an interesting. I wonder if there'd be other ways to do it. The only other thing you could look at would be life gain cards, but even then you have to try to like compare rates of growth. In 2010 to 2015, and then 2015. Plus, they're now. reprinted unevenly, right? Like it would be very, and, very and difficult. The, the way but... the way they were reprinted too is uneven. Like yeah. Felidar Sovereign just got its pants oh, pulled out. Yeah, it did. I have a lot of those in this box. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, well, it's interesting. I'd like to know what people think about that. I mean, that's a. I, I think I agree that Commander has killed a lot of the 60 card themes that used to be popular. But interested to see if people have other another take on it. All right, let's uh. Knock out some uh, some emails. We got a couple. Do we want to do breaking bulk and pick of the week this week? Uh, yeah. Let's save them for the end. Well, let's let's, oh, let's, let's, let's spread them out. Let's do breaking bulk now, and then the emails and pick of the week. Okay, right, sure. Let's break some bulk. I, I don't really care what it says on your spreadsheet that I didn't read. <laughs> breaking bulk time. Breaking bulk time. Break. 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 Oh yeah, breaking bulk. There's so much good stuff. It's a pick. Breaking bulk. The end. Okay. Uh, this card has had one reprint in Modern Masters 2017. Okay. It is a green enchantment. Uh, seal of something? Green naturalized seal. Yeah! Okay. I, di I didn't know what the... Primordium? Is that it? Primordium. Okay. was originally in... Uh, Planar Chaos, Planar Chaos right? yeah. because it was the the seal of cleansing color shift, which didn't really break the color wheel all that much. It kind of seems like a waste, but you can really throw this in black, I guess, or it would be nuts. So that card yeah, would seal not ever be allowed to be in black. Hey man, Oof. Planar Chaos was chaotic. So this card is uh, it's fine. You know, uh, 
it's not a buck or anything, but like I, I see this in bulk, and this is definitely something you should pull out. And I think um, once the shock of the Modern Masters reprinting wears off, I, I think this is uh, going to be real buy listable. So this is just something I've noticed. I wasn't sure if it was a pick or not because I'm seeing it more and more in bulk because I'm, yeah, you know, I've been seeing yeah, a, lot of, people, a lot of I those mean, in bulk. As somebody who picks cards down to the nickel, I can tell you that this card is not a pick in the traditional sense, but I will tell you that I agree with you and I do pick it. Um, I tend to pick a ton of cards that aren't buy-listable, but I still get requests for. So as somebody who likes to be the go-to guy for people to buy cards, um, I like to have the entire 75 when somebody asks for me for it. And if somebody's buying a 75 of, like, Lantern Control, or I don't know where else this card sees play, but um, then I want to have those Seal of Primordiums on hand, even if I'm not going to buy with a new card kingdom for, like, three cents or something like that. Yep, so this I've is a doing... card that I just... And there's some cards I can't bear to bulk out. Like, you just, you know it shouldn't be bulk, but if no one's buying it, I'll throw four of them in a, a sleeve... And sell them for a buck a playset, just out of the a box in my case in my store. And stuff moves, just stuff that like Goblin uh, Tin Street Hooligan and, right. and stuff like that. You know, stuff that like nobody's buying it right now, even for like a nickel. But you you can't bear yourself bear to make yourself bulk it out for free. Yeah, yeah. So I actually just, just have a big pile of. Stuff I sell like a non-zero number of these. Just just put them in a playset. For a buck and just throw them in your case and see what happens. I pulled stuff like that today to take up to the store. Um, just like Murderous Cuts, for instance, is one that's like four cents on a buy list. But when, yeah. that's a real card. It sees play modern sometimes when people want it. I'll sell it to them for 50 cents, right? Because it's they need two to finish out their deck. And you, it, there is yep. a lot of value to having stuff like that at the store. And we have oh, yeah. everything there, so it's really easy to put them in. All right, I'll go next. And this is something that's like also a four buck foil just because like... Muldrotha and, and decks like that can can make good use of it. So that just it's just there's so many, you know, Modern Masters 2017 commons that maybe the common never moves. But well, and there's sort of a it's interesting. It's sort of a delayed effect where right now, Card Kingdom or the Blueprint or whatever is just swimming in those. But two years from now, you actually see higher buy prices on those once the prices have equalized between the different sets. Um, then those harder to find sets actually end up with a higher buy list price than the original print. Whether that's a border thing or whatever, I don't know. Um, but that's just something I've noticed on Parking Note specifically. Yeah, and then who's swimming in them? I am, because I pulled them. Right. Uh, that's exactly what I'm talking about with mutagenic growth, as a matter of fact. The new Phyrexia copies were not by listening for a ton, but the Modern Masters ones were at like 75%, 80% of the value. Yep. Um, all right, I've got one for you here. I've got a Cons of Tarkir Uncommon that I pulled out today. It is a... Uh, it is an enchantment. I bet DJ gets this. Cons of Tarkir. Color. It's a white enchantment. Cons costs, of Tarkir, white enchantment. Costs two mana. What rarity? Uncommon. Is it the... Um, it's the, the silk wrap. The strands? Silk wrap? No, it is not silk wrap. I'm, I think there's strands on every white card, so maybe that's... There are no strands involved. Here. In the art? The art is some dude in the sand. I'm oh, uh, the Brave the Sands. Yeah. Oh, I guess I gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> some, it's some brave dude in the sands. <laughs> he looks quite brave, yeah. You'll Creature, never get this. Creatures you control have vigilance. Each creature you control can block an additional creature. That's yeah, it's Brave one. the Sands. Wow, that's a pretty good card. It is. Uh, it is it's one of those that most people don't know. And again, this is these these the stuff I've been going through recently is exactly what DJ talks a lot about, where they pull out the best stuff. Um, I told you, man, brave the strands. Brave the strands, yeah. But then, like, you know, they still have all the Abzan Falconers, all the Despises, all the Abzan Battle Priests, all the Brave the Sand. Yup, embodiments, embodiments of spring. And those just nickels are the best and dimes bulk at a time. picks. Yep. All right, DJ, the, go they're ahead. the best because those people will always sell you bulk thinking they won, and they will always go back to you. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe like, they did win. Maybe they don't want to buy a bunch of stuff for eight cents at a time. Yeah, maybe they don't. Like, maybe it's easy enough for me because I'm shipping five thousand other cards with it in a box that I had people alphabetize. Right? That's easy. It's worth it. But to if they maybe to individually ship all of their eight cent cards, it may not be. Yeah, they did win. We're doing bitch work. Well, it's like you mow yeah. a dude's lawn. You're like, ha sucker. Yeah, he right. Twenty bucks and done it himself. The idiot. That is kind of true. That is a good analogy. I mean, I do it because sometimes you hit the guy's cradles, right? You you have to buy it all, or you can't buy any. Like, 
you have to be the guy or you're not the guy and that means you have to just put up can we with get the that boxes. on a t-shirt please you have to be the guy or you're not the guy exactly man can we get that on like a teespring please just quote that corbin hostler 2018 2018 i mean i said a month ago i was gonna do teespring and i still haven't so yeah that's time to <laughs> yeah do that. yeah we'll do that no i mean if you're either the person people go to or you won't be and if you try to only pick and choose what you think is going to be good bulk you won't be because people just aren't going to go to you they won't send their friends to you right but if yeah. you just buy it all, yeah, sometimes you have to put up with the boxes where you don't hit anything or you hit, you know, you hit $3 worth and you made your money and it took you 20 minutes, whatever, right? But you didn't really, you know, it wasn't exciting. But then, like, the other box I went through today was Shadowmore and there were four Manamorphoses, right? <laughs> That's, you win some, you lose some. And even when you lose, you don't yeah. lose money. So, if you do I it could, right. Yeah, the, the, you know, the opposite of that is someone's like, oh, we don't sell to him no more. Why not? He ain't the guy. <laughs> ain't what the happened? Guy. One time he wasn't the guy, and now he ain't the guy no more. We don't sells to him. <laughs> All right, DJ, go ahead. I've got my two as usual because I put in the extra effort. This You're just more... padding your stats. Restriction breeds creativity. The more cards I pick, the more chances you have to guess at Corbin. It's a blessing in disguise. Uh, the first one is a Rise of the Eldrazi Blue Common with several reprints. Or Blue Uncommon, sorry. It's a Rise of the Eldrazi Blue Uncommon with several reprints. Twisted Image. Before or after? Twisted Image is Scars of Mirrodin, so... Close. Yeah. Um, Before or after what? Were the reprints before or after Rise of the Eldrazi? It was first printed in Rise of the Eldrazi and then had several reprints. Blue Uncommon, huh? Blue Uncommon Rise of the Eldrazi had several, like, I think it's three reprints. I'm trying to remember wow. that. Wow, what? Uh, one, two, three, four. There are five total printings of this card. One of them is an anthology, so take that as what you will. I'm trying to remember the cards in that set, man. It is a, like, eight cent pick. It is not, like, a dollar fifty or something like that. I am definitely that getting that five block times. mixed up with Shadow with Scars because they were right next to each other. But uh, before it got reprinted like five times, it was a quality fifty cent pick. Was it the? Is it the unblockable thing? Nope. The it's rebound. That's Rise of the Eldrazi. Is right? it yeah. Guard Garmazoa? Ding ding ding! Oh, there you go. Good call. Guard Garmazoa was... is a fog bank, effectively. Um, it's just uh... oh, that get, that's got all those printings because they put it in Plane Chase and then Commander right. and. Yep, Commander, and then Plane Chase, and then Plane uh, Commander 2013 in the Nekusar deck, and then Plane Chase Anthology. Card's been in a lot of precons. Um, it's still like thirty-two cents market price on TCG Player. Uh, whether or not you think that's a pick, that's fine. But it's just sort of a fog bank that does do one damage, so it's not it's not entirely useless in combat. It does give him a little tentacle slap you know fog bank is feels like it's been falling off recently to be honest in terms of buy listing i haven't seen it anymore it was one of, it was in the yeah. first commander deck so everyone's kind of like wow that was their first time playing with fog it was bank because that was what masters, urza saga that? fog What's bank that? was in iconic masters i think i don't remember the last set it was in i know that i just haven't uh, seen the price move on it in a long time and yeah fog bank was in iconic that's why sometimes they're not even on buy lists i just don't see people playing it yeah, exactly. well, i feel like it's been rendered obsolete i think so too it was just too iconic. bad. It's too bad. It's a sweet card. For people who don't I mean, know, it's an O2 flying defender that prevents all damage to be dealt to it. All combat. And it was it good for Commander in like 2012. That's it's it. not great that's for it. Commander in 2018. That's, that's exactly right. It's just got got power leveled out of Commander. And then Give me uh, ghost. Uh, my other breaking bulk is a little bit prison. easier. It is a Innistrad uncommon artifact with no reprints. Butcher's Cleaver. Wrong. <sighs> Close, uh, the but wrong. silver inlaid dagger? No. I hate you. The daggers are common. <sighs> that's why I was trying to think through all those stupid sharpened pitchfork is the other one, but that's a common as well, right? Correct. It is a cor it is a common, so it is not a pick. You're you're getting there. You're crossing off all the list of the equipment in in Estrad. Uh, trepanation blade, but that got reprinted, S didn't that? Still it? wrong. It's graveyard shovel. Wrong. It's Cellar door. It is an equipment. Really? Isn't graveyard shovel and equipment? Yes. No. No. It's Why? Not, it's it not. is two mana tap exile a creature from a grave. Yeah, this right. is a budget card 
alternative for a commander staple. This one's more expensive than Guard Gomazoa. Original Innistrad? Correct. Avacyn's Collar? Avacyn... Mask of Avacyn? There you go. It? Okay. Mask of Avacyn, two mana equipment. We Equipped did it, creature Jason. gets plus one, plus two in hexproof. Uh, we it, we named people, every equipment in Innistrad. We I, did it. Yeah. I mean, some people are like, $3 for Lightning Greaves? That's obscene. And those people buy Mask of Avacyn from me. Um... It's not as good, nearly, but it so does very, very bad. somewhat the same effect of protecting your big dirtly dinosaur, or your big dragon, or your big dumb soldier, or whatever. It's it's just a card that's evaded all these commander deck reprints, because when they put commander deck... Because it's bad. I mean, yeah. That's it is pretty bad, yeah. It's not a good card. Um, and it says one of those Mask cards. of Avacyn. I mean, it's pretty specific. It goes under, yeah, you can't, you obviously can't throw it in like a Dominaria set or whatever, but like it doesn't get put in the commander decks because they always just jam them full of Swift Foot Boots and Lightning Greaves, and this is a budget alternative to those, or sometimes you just want to double up on them. So sure. it's just uh, like you, when you go through an Estrad bulk, you're going to have all the Delvers pulled out. You're not going to find any uh, of those. Mask of Avacyn's 50 cents. That's legit. Yeah. But like Mask of Avacyn, you're going to find it along with those Curse of the Pierced Hearts and. Uh, Moon mists and uh, Moon mist. what's That's the gain life graveyard spell? shovels? What's yeah. the gain life spell? Not of the bones, not of the bones. Yep. All right, hit us with some emails. Uh, this email is from a relevant patron uh, because he gives us a lot of money and he's going to be a guest in a couple weeks. Uh, Stephen Kestner. Good evening, guys. Forty dollar patron here. That's how you start an email. That is the correct. Yeah, that's how you. That's how you make sure we read it. I have been thinking about foil legendary creatures from Dominaria and was thinking about picking up a few of the good uncommon foil legends. This set will be open to Oblivion, but there will be more of the foil uncommons around, and with so many commander options in the set, demand on a single legendary creature is spread out. With that in mind, does buying in on some of these legends make good sense at all, or would that money be better put to use buying pieces or just the top commanders of the set? Great show last week as a $40 patron with two playmats. I was just wondering when my glasses were going to leave frozen Michigan, 74 degree California. Do I have to go to Dr. Grins and pick them up? Steven Ooh. M. Kessner. I'm just waiting to hear like the sound of a glass shattering. <laughs> That's the next level. Here's, your, here's yours. <laughs> I can actually break glass in my house. That'd be weird. Should break it. So Jason, it, do you buy the foil? M is miss I'm going to send you this one that I just used. I'm not gonna wash it, and the M is is uh, rubbed off in the dishwasher. So you can have this one. So Jason, uh, do you buy foil slime foot or foil Tiana or foil uh... Tatiova? No, I bought a foil Tatiova for three bucks for personal use, and I don't, I don't know how I feel about it. Tatiova. Tatiova. Oh, I don't know. I don't. I don't like it. Arv There's... Arvad. Uh, all these. Well, yeah, because the other issue is that they all have pre-release printings. Uh, yeah, so most fan. most foil legends from like a regular set are just like oh there's the there's the pre-release promo but these are an uncommon pre-release promo at that so and i feel like they juice those pre-release packs a little bit they did. to give you a so well everybody got two promos and uh yeah there's just all these foil arvads and all these foil uh i don't know rona or whatever her name is like there's just so many of them well the just only slime foot and tatsy over the only ones people are building in any numbers anyway so yeah exactly and so like that money you're not gonna buy like five or six foil slime foots you all that money can be just better used on like saprolim symbiosis before it spikes or like whatever the next thing of that is because like when the commander yeah. 2018 decks uh are spoiled you're gonna see jason's article and you're gonna hear jason on the podcast being like here's a one dollar a uh, shadow more card that's gonna be eight soon and that's what you want to buy you don't want your money tied up in foil uncommons yeah if you notice when slime foot came out i didn't say oh good slime foot i'm gonna go buy slime foot no nah, man we made money buying all the stupid cards that go in the slime like the deck. stupid uh what was the thing that we were talking about before the show that apparently has fallen empires printings night soil night soil just somebody bought out the commander version but you can still go get 12 cents I mean, Night Soil, versions. it's a euphemism for shit, and I like that. I like that there's a card <laughs> called Poop. That's cool. Isn't that fecundity? Uh, this one is from a while ago, but it is it is uh, requested to be anonymous, and this person sent this email, like, a while ago. And they want I DJ to it, keep it anonymous? Then So you're not going to read their email address? Or their... Uh, 
Well, they sent it a while ago, and then they had to send it in a question, and then I said I was going to get to it eventually, and now I'm getting to it. So, hey, person who I said I'd read your email anonymously, how's it going, Brew Crew? I have a little question about shipping. If I send a package with tracking, and the customer says they did not receive it, yet the post office says they did, what would you do? Oh, that's a good question. The post office said they received it. I'm inclined to say get wrecked. Well, I think this depends a lot on the method of how you sold the card. So if you sold it on eBay and you are the seller, you are probably screwed. Um, eBay is a very buyer friendly, uh, always goes in favor of the buyer. Like buyer said card was fake, buyer gets a refund. Buyer said card didn't arrive, buyer gets a refund. If you sold it on TCG player and you shipped it with tracking and then the tracking says that the package was delivered correctly, then you're going to be in a lot better shape for uh, your dispute. Um, TCG Player is a site that tries to work with sellers and buyers both amicably, and they'll probably help you out. If I sold a card on Twitter, um, personally, if I just had somebody DM me and they're like, I want this card, and then I shipped it to them with tracking, and then the post office says that it never arrived, and or the post office says it arrived, and they said it didn't, I'll probably give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, yeah, less so if it less so if it becomes a recurring issue, I'm more, less likely to sell to that person. But um, yeah, if you're the seller, I think it's your responsibility to just basically eat that loss, unless you are selling on a platform like TCG Player, which has sort of a um has your back in the sets. Everyone like knows what they're getting into on TCG Player or eBay for that matter, right? You know, on eBay that as a seller, you're eating the risk. You know, on TCG Player, you are covered. Like you have, yeah, you get tracking because player, that's the point. That's, yeah, so everyone player, knows if you ship P PWE, you eat the risk. Right. But like the buyer knows that if you send it with tracking, tracking says it arrived. That's just the way it works. But I agree. If you sell to someone personally, uh, whether it's, you know, Facebook or Twitter or whatever, right. As the person doing the selling and sort of it's your name on the line in a sense, you just, it's just the cost of doing business. Yep. Kind of have to eat and, it. and guess what? The, the, the U.S. Postal Service screws up all the time. Uh, my dad screwed up and bought a squatty potty, even though I said, don't do it yet. <laughs> and they sent it to his neighbor's house, two houses down. And so they said he's delivered. And he's like, potty. no, it's not delivered. So he called squatty potty. They're like, I don't know. Call the post office. Post office is like, well, are your neighbor's addresses similar to yours? I'm like, well, how hard is your job? Just drop it off at the place where you're supposed to drop it off. Did, then, really? Are your neighbor's his addresses His neighbor similar? two houses down came over and brought it. Is your it. He's neighbor's like, I got address your... two houses down similar to yours? I don't know. I think it's probably about eight numbers different, you idiot. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> it's different enough. So, like, so his neighbor, who he'd never met, he's like, Here's, I got your, your, <laughs> your, your potty. <laughs> yeah. And oh, so uh, the reason so he probably person... thought it was like some toilet add on because my dad's all old and feeble now. And he's like, I could poop normal. I just <laughs> wanted my feet up. And he screwed up. My, my dad got the embarrassing ordeal of having to talk to a neighbor about a squatty potty. He wasn't even supposed about to his buy. night soil habits because yeah. <laughs> he didn't wait till we said to order a squatty potty with our affiliate link. We're back we in contact with them. Just throwing that out there. Okay. Are, who's getting cock teased more, us or our fans? I don't know, to be honest, because I, I, we, we went through a different person who responded on Twitter, who then linked us back to the original person. Who was like, "Oh yeah, I just kind of didn't get back to you ever and forgot, but maybe we'll be able to do it now." Tweet at them. Tw tweet at them. It's they've been favoriting the tweets, so it's been working. There's somebody at Squatty Party that knows the Brainstorm Brewery has some real yeah. shit clout. They they cl <laughs> shit clout. <laughs> All right, we have any more emails? We do some pictures. We are the, the number two this, MTG podcast. There's a little bit more to this email. Um, and so oh, if you cares? if you <laughs> reverse on. the roles, what would you do if you're the customer? And so the, one of the reasons this person wanted this email sent anonymously is uh, because they bought something from a higher end store that's relatively well named. Um, and this store didn't really resolve the situation well, and so the, there's no name dropping involved on either side. What but like, store? so if you're somebody that bought What's something, the store's name rhyme with. If you're somebody that bought something from a large store uh, and then it doesn't arrive and they said, well, did, what do you do as that person? So you said large, which sounds kind of like lard, which rhymes with card. It was Card Kingdom. Card Kingdom confirmed. Oh, I thought you were going to say Card Garden. That would have been funnier. Oh, that's you. That's yeah. not nobody a large buys store. From, nobody buys from Card that's Garden. That's not a large store. Um, that's a great question. Actually, oh no! Your four masks of Avison got lost in the mail. It's my it is my belief the store should eat the cost. 
Um, but again, as a store, you need blanket policies and people will take advantage of you if you are overly generous. So I, I just automatically refunded. It happened four times on eBay and I automatically refunded three times and let the guy do a case one time, which went my way. When you bought? No, when I was when I was a seller and somebody said the stuff didn't show up. Oh, you had a case go your way as a seller? Really? Yeah. Nice. Because it was a trailer park. Okay. <sighs> I'm not saying that's why eBay ruled in my favor. I'm saying that's why I let it go to eBay. Okay. Um, I I would hope that the store's customer service department would do something to make it right there. Um, that's a that's a tough situation. So as the customer, I think it honestly would probably depend on the details, on the amount of the order, because like I would be very upset if I bought a hundred dollars worth of cards from somewhere and they never showed up, and they're like, "Well, they showed up. You're at a hundred bucks." Like I would have a real problem with that because I would view well, that. Did we as, get an email from a dude who said someone slid open the card? Or well, he sent a buy list order. Yeah, he sent a buy list order. Like, yeah. Yeah, like the empty envelope showed up at Card Kingdom, and they're like, Bleh. stuff like that happens. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't know. I guess I would hope that the store would make it right, but if they don't, then you have two options, right? You can either throw a fit about it and hope to get something out of it. I'm sure that they're legally covered because they wouldn't do it otherwise, or you can just not buy from there, right? It's kind of like that's capitalism. You might just be screwed in this scenario, but. They are kind of screwed too because they just lost all your future business by for over a hundred bucks or fifty bucks or whatever because they wanted to you know to play hardball with you yep. over your cards not showing up in the mail like and they didn't do anything wrong they lost your future business through no fault of their own well that's not necessarily true like they did nothing wrong in the original shipping right but if somebody contacted me especially if this person had a history of buying for me with no issues or something and they have an order not show up. I'd probably, if I would like, I would hope that the customer service representatives would be empowered to make that right for the customer. Yep. Um, knowing that it costs you money now, but it makes you money in the future because you keep a customer. They post on Reddit about how you made it right for them, et cetera. You get great publicity, blah, blah, blah. And some amount of fraud probably is a, is a part of that. And you have to have systems in place to determine fraud from real things. But I mean, it certainly doesn't do you any good business. It certainly doesn't do you any favors as a business. To burn bridges like that over a small amount of money. My trailer park policy seems to work pretty well for me, so that's my system in place. All right, there you go. All right, guys, let's uh, let's get some picks of the weekend. Get on out of here before right. uh, this storm takes out my power. <laughs> pick of the week. Pick of the week. Pick of the week. Time for the pick of the week. I have a pick from Commander 2015. I think it's my least favorite deck out of that entire series of decks, and none of those decks I thought were particularly good. This is the experience counter year. I'm, I'm very familiar with this cycle of decks. Yeah, these are all terrible, right? Like, the Azuri deck... Oh, uh, the Marin one and the Azuri one are pretty strong. And they're, my issue is not the power level. My issue is the gameplay. And essentially, it's, a, it's, it's the same as every mechanic I never like from Wizards which are mechanics that you can't interact with, and that's what experience counters are. But you can um, interact with the, the commander. You can, which puts you into this game where either the person playing the experience counter commander gets their commander killed on sight until they just can't play it anymore, and then they didn't really do anything, or they play it and they win because they're all broken. Specifically, Mrs. of the Igma is Magnus, which is my pick this week, um, which has uh, been climbing up for about eh, six months, almost a year now, and is starting to show some momentum. Um, over two dollars, so I think it's probably going to hit three, four, five, or whatever. But definitely has some upward growth going for it. And this is the one I hate playing with the most against the most because it's the blue red thing. Whenever you cast instant or sorcery with converted mana cost greater than the number of experience years counters on it, you get an experience counter. Instant and sorcery spells cost one less for each experience counter you have. So it's like you play it on four, you either kill this immediately or they start getting stuff, then they win two turns later, or they play it on six and they win that turn. Whatever. It was, just, it was the epitome of the kill this commander on site, or the game is over immediately. Because it's a cost reduction mechanic with something you can't interact with, and they can constantly replay it. Those was a bad year, Commander Dex. So this but. dodged the uh, the Commander Anthology. Anthology 2 reprint. 
because it's trash. They opted to go with a Marin deck. Well, Marin was the most popular by far, and honestly, the one I don't mind playing against. It's really, really good, but it, it's not win the it's not win the game instantly good like. I mean, Mizics. Daxos is not at all win the game instantly good either. Well, I would, I've never even played against Daxos. Daxos so that's how is bad the one was. I was most excited about because I was like, this is so good with like, uh, the Sarah thing. Sarah Sanctum. Sarah Sanctum. No one even yeah, plays Daxos. So that's how bad that one was. I know it was, and it could have been good. This this it was just a bad mechanic. That's why I also hated the last. Well, year's... every game I won with that, I was just tutoring for the um the sanguine bond right exactly. exquisite blood combo. Well, it was honestly the same problem I had with last year's commanders, where they have abilities from the command zone, and it's all just stupid. Well, everybody hated Aloro, and they're like, oh, we heard you love this ability, so they gave right. us a bunch yeah, more. Yeah, Aloro's like the most benign version of that ability you could possibly have. And they're like, you know and what's people better? people still let's make, frothing. Right. And they're like, no, let's make copies. Let people make copies of their creatures from the command zone. You, you just get yeah. an emblem that says you get to copy all of your creatures when they come into play. What could go wrong? Yeah, it was just it's just yeah. bad design. Wizards is never going to learn that. Mechanics that people can't interact with are not fun. Why everyone hates expert? All right, what I think they I think they know that, and like they do it now. Yeah, so I just don't get people it. People writing essays it. for years about how much they hated Aloro, and they're like, "No, oh, we learned nothing." Yeah, they just keep doing it. It's fine. Like if you're gonna do it with something like Aloro, that's fine. It's just two life. That doesn't matter. But why would you possibly put? Yeah, that's Fire Main Angel, and who gives a yeah, shit? Why would yeah. you possibly put good abilities on this stuff? I've ran into about it before, though. All right, you get you guys in there with your picks. I have a, an Iconic Masters card that is probably at its bottom because it was in Iconic Masters. That was its only other printing. It is Runescard Demon. Mm, yep, that card got expensive. Well, it's below two bucks. I mean, at its peak. Oh, it got, it got expensive before the reprint? Yeah. Yeah, getting reprinted at, uh, uh, at Rare, again, um, not great for it, but... It was an intro uh, deck thing, right? It was an intro deck foil in M12, yes. Mm -hmm. And it was still, still, the, it was still uh, climbed up to 750. The I Iconic mean, Masters Krakos foil is still an intro deck foil. Krakos right. can hold its own. Yeah. Yeah. So Runescard Demon is just dumb. It's it's expensive, but it's like a, it's a tutor demon, and like you don't pay for demons. You put them into play cheating. So uh, it's below two bucks, man. That's a $4 card. Yep. Might take it. It may take a while. Could get reprinted, but I doubt it. Speaking of Krinko, it was just in. Uh, I guess it's second dual deck in a row or whatever. Cards gonna get pretty cheap here. Pretty good buy. It's a. I like. Yeah, we're back on Dominaria. There's more goblins. When was? It was in oh, Merfolk versus goblins. goblins. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which was I don't know at some point recently, right? Yeah. It was like end of last year. Yeah. Yep. Bottoming out around two bucks. Yep. That wasn't the most recent one, was it? It was like Inventors versus... Elves versus Inventors was just... Uh... Right, that's the most recent build-up, but it, it, it's... Jesus, what a stupid theme. <laughs> it's kind of dumb. <laughs> it's not Elves versus Goblins, it's Elves versus Goblin Welder. He's an inventor. Alright, DJ, All right. what do you got? I have... Uh... Let's go with Ramanop Excavator. It's, that's it's already a, on the move. It's two fifty right now. Card's yeah. stupid cheap, actually. Um, it's Magus of the Crucible. Why is it cheap? It, it, I actually was I, I was toying with this being my pick before the cast started, but I feel like it's already on the move. Well, it's I mean, just it's slowly go, though. It's going to continue to be on the move until it's like six dollars. That's the that's why it's my pick of the week. Don't think there's a yeah. bunch of our devastation opened, but it was crazy if this card was ever below two dollars to me. This card is just sort of one of the, uh, I mean, Crucible of Worlds is still, what, 55, 60, I think? So. And the Draft Weekend promo is, is just about the same price as the regular one, and the art looks pretty good. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You don't like the art? It's okay. I would well, the say other that... Foil, the other foil is uh, a little more. I worry, I worry about this being in a commander deck, but... Because it's a pretty staple effect that's definitely popular, um, obviously. Which I mean, it can go either way. It can either mean they'll reprint it in a commander deck, or it means they won't ever reprint it and wait till it's twenty bucks, and then it sells a set. But it does say ramen app on it, so that makes it a little harder. Yeah, so that's a little tougher to reprint. I yeah, I mean, 
This was almost my pick. I like it, obviously. I was actually the price of ramming up excavator made me look at Wayward Swordtooth because I thought yeah. that was going to be cheap, but it's not. It's it's uh, cart sweet, also. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I, was, I was hoping Wayward Swordtooth would have fallen because that just seems like an EDH ability. Uh, Todd Stevens, man. Todd Stevens playing yeah. his Green White Value Town in Modern. Speaking of announcement time, Brew Crew is back for the other Brew Crew. Saffron Olive, Todd Stevens, and myself for Team Standard Super League. We play next week on Tuesday from Rudis on. Ugh. Yeah, I snuck it in there. I like that one. I like that time you lost. <laughs> that was one, good. Once, once. No, we're it's a single elimination Super League this time around. We play next uh, the twenty second. So great. Uh, we play great. Team Star City games. Great. Take them down. Thank you, DJ. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Great. Nobody cares. Nobody who. <sighs> <laughs> We're not going to get one email from people being like, tell us more about you, stupid yeah. league. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you guys want to say before we get out of here this week? Oh. Oh. Okay, yeah, helpful. Let's read another email. That's the only way this could get <laughs> more unpleasant. Look, I'll send, all, I'll send your dumb glasses that you paid for and you're entitled to <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, you tell them, Jason. I'll probably send you some extra ones just to get through the shitty ones and then... Then we'll get some we'll good ones. Try again. to order we'll some good glasses. We might, we might see what we can do. Get a different, uh, maybe change, to, like have something else with the logo on it, something cooler. I don't know. Then a glass? No, I mean, yeah, like we we'll have, have the glass, it. but I don't know. Just see if there's any way we can set it apart besides, you know, being dishwasher safe. Yeah, man. Um, I didn't really anticipate the second company having such poor quality, but like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? All right. Well, glasses do that. All glasses, all every pint glass I've ever had in my life has done that in the dishwasher. That's true. Except for the first company. That's true. Me too. Actually, I've had some that are just so. that are now completely blank, and they started off as coming from whatever brewery. So what are you gonna do? Um, we don't care about banking any of this Patreon money, so we will spend more for quality and like give you guys stuff that at, basically at cost. You know, because whatever we are, we are committed to not embezzling our Patreon money. <laughs> that, is, that is correct. Because we all have jobs. That's right. Okay. Well, there you go, everybody. We won't steal from you. That's our final pitch for the week. <laughs> well, no, it's like it, I mean, it's our money from the Patreon, but like we're we're reinvesting of it. Of course. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for listening. Let us know what you think about all this. Let us know what you think about the uh, about the spreadsheet and uh, the talk about it. Because it was pretty fun, I think. So. That's Brainstorm Brewery. Uh, I think I'm actually going to be out of town next week, so you guys are going to have to suffer through without me. But we do have a nice guest lined up. So, Corbin uh, out of town for an episode? Unheard of. <laughs> All right, everybody. Brainstorm Brewery, we will see you next week. I'm going to go speak. I'm going to go take a beach. So, no, hang on. Wait, Corbin. Wait, Corbin. I, boop. I don't care. <laughs> I have to boop. I have to boop.